Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our live broadcast and others of you are joining us on Facebook Live and Twitter. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. Nearly half of Americans report living without meaningful social interaction. They are lonely. Experts have declared chronic loneliness an epidemic and social isolation a public health issue. New research reveals that loneliness shortens life, leads to higher rates of diseases like high blood pressure, and is linked to suicide and other mental health issues. For people of color already grappling with racial and ethnic discrimination, loneliness hits even harder, creating greater anxiety and depression. Tonight, the impact of loneliness in communities of color. Joining us tonight, Dr. Charmaine Jackman, psychologist and clinical director of Innovative Psychology Services. Dr. Erica Lee, psychologist at Boston Children's Hospital and instructor of psychology in the psychiatry department at Harvard Medical School. Marty Martinez, chief of health and human services for the city of Boston. And Taylor Stewart, a doctoral student in the counseling psychology program at Boston College. She is also a staff member of the Institute for the Study and Promotion of Race and Culture at Boston College. Welcome to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jackman, I'm going to start with you because yeah. we think about loneliness. It feels amorphous, I think, mm. to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But really, basically, mm. it's just a lack of connectedness. And it's actually more about the perception Mm -hmm. of a lack of connection uh, of connectedness so people perceiving that they're not connected to friends or family members will experience um, what we call loneliness now how is it that we have gotten to the point where um, many of the experts are calling this an epidemic that people are so you know uh, so disconnected if you will so isolated I think it's not that clear that people are actually more disconnected than in past generations I think there's more information now and people have words to label that um, experience that they're having. Um, there are also phenomena like technology and social media, which I think heightens people's perception of being alone or not connected to other mm -hmm. people. As you watch somebody, someone's life play out on social media and you're not a part of that, that can um, increase our, um, your feelings of loneliness. So one thing we do know, and all of you will express, is that if you are a person of color, <coughs> it hits harder. Of now course. why? We know that racial disparities, um, in fact, people of color at, at, at storming um, rates. And we see that in terms of racial discrimination at work. Um, students and people are experiencing more, more discrimination and that connects to mental health and how people are experiencing um, different phenomena. I, I, yes. I also think that it, it connects back to thinking about people of color and we think about immigrants. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think about the experience of being an immigrant in this country and. I have to just turn on the news and turn on anything that's happening in Washington and, and you can feel like isolated, you can feel alone, mm -hmm. and you can also wonder if other people are experiencing the same pain you feel. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you, if you don't feel like other people have that experience, um, then it can feel, it can feel lonely. Right. Um, and you mm -hmm. then can start to not want to share, not want to talk mm -hmm. about it and disconnect mm -hmm. uh, because the messaging sort of makes you feel like you did something wrong. Right. Um, so I think that's also a part of it, especially in immigrant communities. Mm -hmm. And I want to be clear because, again, because for some people this is going to feel like, well, this is kind of fuzzy, I can't get my hands mm -hmm, around yeah. it, that there is uh, real data connected yeah. to this. So with the work that um, you did looking at the, the, the black men and connected to the PTSD, yep. talk, talk about that a little bit and how loneliness factored into that. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, if you if you think about the experiences that not only men of color have, but if you think experience of most racial and ethnic minority groups, you can see that folks, um, when they experience negative messaging, experience negative ex um, interactions, racism, discrimination, mm -hmm. it starts to uh, put you at risk. Um, it start, you start to experience trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and so that trauma then leads you to need more supports, more resources. Um, and, and also I think the biggest question is it leads you to find, to try to find help. 
Um, and especially when you can't find it from folks who look like you or folks who understand where you come from, there's an even bigger gap. And so I think that for men of color, for immigrants, I think it's true for most populations in, that are in that bucket, I think it's really easy to start to wonder, where do I turn, where am I at, and how do I actually get the supports that I need? Okay. Dr. Lee, you've done a lot of work looking at uh, social media and young people. Now, what happens to kids of color as they're, and social media, by the way, is a kind of a double-edged sword. Right. So for some people, it's, it's helpful mm -hmm. in reducing social isolation. For others, it is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, social media is really tricky because I think in some ways, to Dr. Jackman's point, everyone can be technically more connected these days. So mm -hmm. people might have, especially for young people, they have hundreds of friends on Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook. That's friends in quotes. Exactly, okay. yes, 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 right. like okay. digital friends, right. right? Like on their friends list. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's how they feel um, subjectively in real life in terms of how connected they might be to other people. And for a lot of young people these days, they look at everybody else and they say, oh my gosh, everyone else has like hundreds of mm -hmm. friends or thousands mm -hmm. of friends and everyone's life looks so great online, but it's not necessarily connected to how their life is day to day. And that can end up making them feel, you know, sort of even though they have hundreds of friends on paper, that they're actually less connected in daily life. Um, and, the, and the whole phenomenon with kids of color and the bullying online, which then leads to a lonely experience. Absolutely. And I think that that's also something we see more in people who are in minority groups, right? And if you think about intersectionality, the more sort of minority groups or the groups where people are on the downside of power that someone belongs to, the more likely they are to be targeted. And I think there's this unfortunate phenomenon that's been emerging over the last several years as social media and technology have become bigger and bigger in our world, where, you know, I think the bar for what constitutes sort of bullying or what constitutes acceptable behavior among young people has kind of gotten lower and lower, mm. where now, you know, it's okay for teenagers or even younger than that to just say to each other, you know, like, I didn't like what you did today, you should just kill yourself. Mm -hmm. And I don't think kids recognize the power of that because we're so connected and it's so easy mm -hmm. to just like mm -hmm. shoot out a quick mm -hmm. message. Um, that isn't something they would necessarily say in person to someone else to their face, but it's mm -hmm. lost power because it's digital and it's a little bit anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's actually, unfortunately, that's the sort of double-edged sword part of it, allowed young people to be more engaged in bullying or to be the recipients of bullying, especially people of color, because it's so easy to do now and so it becomes kind of commonplace and people don't think twice about just hitting send or mm -hmm. you know posting something online and we should mention there are actually a couple of uh, headline grabbing stories mm -hmm. where young person yes. said to another one right. you should just kill yourself right. and the person mm -hmm. acted on it and yeah. responded in that way yeah. Yeah. Uh, now Taylor one of the phenomenons that's just you know it feels so frustrating so as folks of color sort of move up socially mm -hmm. on the ladder they're still carrying some of the day-to-day -day discrimination that they have to encounter, but they're also moving away from their communities, mm -hmm. which therefore can create, mm -hmm. lead to another mm -hmm. deeper sense of isolation and loneliness. Mm -hmm. Talk about that if you would. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, it's It can be very challenging, particularly as you do continue to move upward, particularly as a person of color mm -hmm. um, within this country, we deal with and grapple with feelings of loneliness. Um, particularly if you're in a predominantly white context, right? So if you're a predominantly white context in school, at work, in organizations you're a part of, all of a sudden you may feel not only lonely but alone. Mm -hmm. And as you begin to distance yourself further away from those communities that you grew up with, people who may share a common racial, ethnic backgrounds with you, similar beliefs, mm -hmm. um, similar ideas and values, it can feel even more isolating. Mm -hmm. um, you can feel much more lonely. You can you see an increased rate of um, mental health issues that are occurring if the individual does not find ways or supports and resources to really help them um, kind of shift their perspectives and develop that psychological strength necessary mm -hmm. to continue to move forward. So how do you go from, you know, what might be just a kind of, as we talk about um, mm -hmm. depression, you know, mm -hmm. we always hear the discussion <laughs> is there's a difference between between being blue and being depressed, mm -hmm. clinically depressed. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say that with when we talk about chronic loneliness and its impact, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. it, it um, there's a difference between one day I kind of just feel kind of lonely mm -hmm. and there's nobody around, whatever. Right. Then right. what then persists? Right. Um, right. Can you all speak to that and how we see that? Because I, I'm imagining people are listening to this saying. Well, how do I separate out what what has become dangerous right. with loneliness? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in terms of clinically, th there's no diagnosis per se per for loneliness. Um, but we see loneliness and social isolation as key to depression and anxiety. Those are key symptoms that we want to pay attention to. 
you know, for teenagers, we might hear kids talking about, oh, I'm bored, or um, mm. I'm feeling numb or empty. So if you hear those comments kind of frequently, those are really things to pay attention to. I think the chronic loneliness you might see is when people are really kind of withdrawn from themselves. And you do have to make a distinction because I, there are people who <coughs> don't necessarily find pleasure being with other people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they feel lonely, right? So again, it's that perception of your social connectedness or social isolation. Um, so someone who's really withdrawn. Um, and then they're going to probably experience some ex um, symptoms, more symptoms of depression and, and anxiety. So those might be key factors to look for. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's interesting that you say that because I think about some work that we do in the city. We mm -hmm. do some work around um, pr trying to prevent uh, social isolation for seniors. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and what is that work? It, it's events. It's community mm -hmm. events. Yeah. It's bringing yeah. people together. Mm -hmm. It's good times. It's right. all these things that you right. do. And I think that you can, you know, my experience is from the city, we can meet seniors that, um, you know, those events are their lifeline to the community. Mm -hmm. Those are events of the time that they get mm -hmm. to celebrate with folks yeah. um, and connect with folks. Um, and we do them because they feel good, but they keep people connected. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also experience folks who you may have been the only person they've talked to in three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and so you start to understand what's the difference between they're lonely or they're mm -hmm. isolated mm -hmm. versus they're no longer taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. They're no longer mm -hmm. showing up. They're, right. People are, are concerned because yeah. maybe they don't check in anymore. Yeah. Or their neighbors haven't seen them in a couple mm -hmm. days. And so, again, it's, I think it's a great point, Kelly. It's the line between... They're, they're lonely mm -hmm. versus now their well-being mm -hmm. and their wellness is at mm -hmm. stake. Mm -hmm. um, and, this, and the city, we do lots of things to make sure that we're on both ends of that mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. both about how do we keep people connected and, yeah. and engaged yeah. as, we, as we age, yeah, um, but how do we always think, also think about people's health and wellness? Mm -hmm. I think you have to think about both along mm -hmm. the lines. I think it's important that you raise that, you know, elderly people are dealing with this because we often focus on young people because right. yeah. this is where you two live, right. yes. Right. Um, <laughs> but that is, you know, that both things are happening at the same time exactly. um, and if we know that loneliness can be foundational mm -hmm. uh, to leading to other kinds of mental health issues mm -hmm. then you know we really have to pay attention to it when you're younger yeah, um, I mean you want to do it as you're older mm -hmm. as well but certainly to try to sort of stem mm -hmm. the tide away from that H how do you do that how do you how do you begin to see what something that has changed from somebody is not taking care of themselves as Ha, um, Marty has just described, uh, and it's become something different mm -hmm. for young people. I definitely think that I know in terms of diagnosing, particularly, you know, anxiety and depressive disorders, you're looking for that, is there a functional impairment? You know, what is the functionality? What, the, what is the individual's functionality? If they're functioning, they're fine. You know, maybe there's not a mental health diagnosis present, mm -hmm. um, but if they are that on that side where their well-being is at stake, they're not getting up, they're not doing things, they're not able to function the way they typically would, then that's clearly an issue. And I think that's something that is great to think about and work on is kind of, as you said a little earlier, is an individual, a young person can think, because I don't have as many friends, because I don't have as many friends on social media or in my real life, um, then that means that I'm, I may be lonely, um, I'm alone. But when it comes to loneliness, people need to understand that it's not just about the quantity of your friendships and relationships, it's about the quality mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think that's something that we can do is begin teaching you know, children, adolescents, emerging adults, um, what does it mean to actually be in thriving, healthy connection with mm -hmm. other people? Mm -hmm. How do you create yeah. satisfying and life-giving relationships? Uh, and I think that starts with not only in relationship with yourself, but kind of understanding what that can look like with mm -hmm. others and with your community. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. And I think it's also important to validate for people of all ages that everyone has times where they feel lonely, mm -hmm. right? That that's right. sort of, you know, a part of the sort of human condition, that we all have that and that that's okay. Because I think a lot of times people feel like it's just them, you know, like I'm the only one who doesn't have friends or I'm the only one who feels this way. Mm -hmm. And that can actually make people less likely to kind of go out there and actually have the social experiences that you were describing mm -hmm. to sort of feel more connected to people. So they start isolating, which then makes them feel even more mm -hmm. alone and it kind of mm -hmm. ends up forming this negative cycle um, because they think it's just them or that there's something wrong with them if they're feeling lonely or they have times when they go out and they're in a big group but they're still feeling alone. So I think it's also important to validate to people that it's okay if sometimes you feel alone, that's part of the human condition and that there's things you could do about it mm -hmm. to feel more connected, although it might take mm -hmm. a little bit of effort. 
Well, in a time where the the rise of anxiety and suicides across and among mm -hmm. certainly uh, in communities of color, you know that ne never used to be discussed. Right. People just mm -hmm. not right. that mm -hmm. does not something happens. So that's some right. white people right. stuff that right. was said right. over and over mm -hmm. again. Absolutely. But there, the data is clear now that yep. the mm -hmm. rise in suicides. Mm -hmm. um, there are folks coming out to talk about it. This is and young kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, young people yes. all across the board. Mm -hmm. So. To pay attention to this, I just want to bring it back to let people know that it's 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 not a small thing, mm -hmm. and yet at the same time, it's important um, be, uh, that we un make people understand you can be in a crowd, in a group, mm -hmm. and still be exactly. lonely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do you address yeah. that? How do you make people understand yeah. what that means? I, I think that's so, it's <laughs> it's so great you say that because I think you know I come from a big Latino family and. Um, and you know, I, there's very few times ever that I'm, I've been alone, right? <laughs> <laughs> Physically, right? Um, from the beginning to the end of the day. And so um, I think that's great. And I think sometimes in our families, we're used to big uh, families, and we, we we're loud, and we laugh, and we you know enjoy ourselves. So I think to the, to think, how can you feel lonely when you're never alone? You're always with someone. You're always mm -hmm. celebrating. You're always doing something. Mm -hmm. So I think we also have to give voice to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's why this is so important mm -hmm. that we speak to the moment of saying like, this is how I feel, and this and share that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's there's so much about trying not to share our business beyond our own walls yeah. Yeah. Um, in our communities. And I think making sure that we're willing to share that and we're willing to talk about it and to lift it up because mm -hmm. um, I think it's important. I think your point. I the only the times I have felt alone sometimes is when I'm with the most people, mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, mm -hmm. do I identify? Do yeah. I connect? Do I mm -hmm. still feel like this community? So mm -hmm. yeah. I think that that's a part of it. But I mm -hmm. I think it's my my piece would really be about lifting it up and giving voice and not mm -hmm. being afraid to recognize it and not being dismissive of it when someone says mm -hmm. I feel alone or I feel mm -hmm. you know I feel like I'm missing something, yeah. um, but to value it. Yeah. I think. I think I want to to raise your point, go, go back on your point too. I think there are ways in which families have changed the way they interact. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, at the high school I work with, I hear students, you know, stories from my adolescents all the time. And one of the things that I find is they spend lots of time in their room on their phones. Mm -hmm. They're not connecting to mm -hmm. their parents. Mm -hmm. We, you know, in communities of color, we have parents who are working multiple jobs mm -hmm. and sometimes not at home. So there are ways in which our family life is really changing. It's kind of connecting and contributing mm -hmm. to some of the loneliness that people are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about people don't, because of that, because there's more technology to allow you to do many things in your life that you don't necessarily have mm -hmm. to interact yes. physically. Right. Um, a lot of people do not know how to. <laughs> so, I mean, mm -hmm. frankly, mm -hmm. that's what we're it's talking true. about, right? Yeah. So, true. actually, it's pretty scary for people mm -hmm. to say, well, yeah, I'm inside and I feel lonely. Mm -hmm. But the thought of trying to put myself yeah. out mm -hmm. there right. when mm -hmm. I don't know how to connect with you mm -hmm. is quite something. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I would think, and I'm not to strength, you all are, <laughs> that, the, the, that the anxiety that a lot mm -hmm. of folks are feeling mm -hmm. are around just mm -hmm. general trying mm -hmm. to live mm -hmm. um, in this kind of traumatic space mm -hmm. uh, does not help then mm -hmm. for people to feel like they can risk going yeah. out to try to mm -hmm. connect. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and I think it's trying to give people practical strategies and tools to do it, mm -hmm. right? And giving people the ways to connect, right? So, for example, we we do these. Um, kind of speak out town hall for mm -hmm. veterans mm -hmm. um, all across the city. We do them and we do them again so people can not only tell their stories, which are powerful, mm -hmm. um, but so people can connect to others like them. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is a lot of veterans will come back and say, you know, I'm here, I'm struggling with this, mm -hmm. I'm struggling with that, yeah. and I don't know anyone else. Mm -hmm. right. And for the first time I met veterans like me, whether they were African American or women or mm -hmm. LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think like giving mechanisms for people to connect, mm -hmm. it may have to be really structured yeah. mm -hmm. so that people have an opportunity right. and it's not like you so just take it out of the hands it. of the people to initiate. Yeah. Yes. So, uh -huh. so, yeah. So sometimes I think that's part of it mm -hmm. um, because it's again, it's, it's a turnkey, right? Mm -hmm. I come, I speak yeah. and mm -hmm. next thing I know, wow, you're just, yeah. you're just like me. Yeah. So that's one way I think yeah. to, mm -hmm. to try to do that. Yeah. But. Well, we talk, you know, I, I know we're talking about the, the, the downsides of this, but we should also, what what can be done? How can people, mm -hmm. you know, just your average person, mm -hmm. get themselves um, from a point of understanding that they do feel lonely and they want to do something mm -hmm. about it, but begin that process? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, yeah. what say you, Dr. Lee? Um, I think it helps at least for younger children and even teenagers for parents to start to 
open up that conversation mm -hmm. of like, I notice you've maybe not been wanting to see your friends as much, or mm -hmm. you've been invited to a few things and maybe you haven't wanted to go, or it seems like you're spending a lot of time in your room alone on the phone. You know, you can start with figuring out just within the family, are there ways that we might feel more connected? Like it's easy for you to just be like texting me from upstairs, mm -hmm. but maybe you should come down and let's figure out some ways where we spend some like regular time together. And then how do we think about how to maybe get you back out into your life a little bit, if mm -hmm. that's something that's important to you, because not everyone, you know, necessarily wants that. But if you're feeling lonely and sort of social isolated how do we help you connect more and that can be what communities are you a part of so are there things happening at school are there clubs you might want to join are there athletic activities are there community organizations mm -hmm. do you belong to a religious organization that there's lots of different ways to maybe start um, with what feels most comfortable to people and then kind of branch out because I think most people are especially young people are so scared of rejection right mm -hmm. and sort of to this idea of like well now we're so used to doing everything via technology that it almost feels scary to even just text someone out of the blue or a lot of young people I work with will say, I don't even know how to contact that person because I don't know what their Snapchat wow. name is, or I don't know, you know, like we're not, we're not friends that way. Oh, like I'm not, a, or my parents yeah. won't let me use social media, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. Whereas before everyone had like everyone's phone numbers and right. it was like yeah. not a big thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that it can be really scary to make that first move. So this idea, I think, of having these like turnkey <laughs> events or saying, what communities are you already a part of and can you take one small step, mm -hmm. maybe supported by caregivers mm -hmm. or teachers or the other, you know, adults or young people in your life that you feel comfortable with and kind of get you moving so you get that confidence of like, okay, I was accepted and this felt really good and it was fun, mm -hmm. let me try it again and go back next time. And I met this one person or I met two people who seemed, you know, really excited or interested that I was there. I got to do something I really enjoyed and that makes me want to try it again and then naturally kind of getting the ball rolling from there. What would you say, Taylor? I agree with you 100%. One thing that I think is very tempting is when you're trying to get out of a state of isolation or you're feeling very, very lonely, very alone, it can be extremely scary, extremely intimidating to think, mm -hmm. well, now I just need to be out there completely and I need to be connected mm -hmm. to all these people. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very extreme mm -hmm. shift to make suddenly that most people almost anyone would be overwhelmed by that mm -hmm. thought. And so for me, I work with college students. And so with um, my clients who may be, you know, troubling with sense of belonging or issues related to loneliness, we do a lot of checking our thoughts work. And mm -hmm. I think that that's something that anyone can do wherever mm -hmm. they are. Mm -hmm. And that starts- Stop the negative thoughts. Stop, mm -hmm. not even stopping them, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. paying attention to them. Mm -hmm. So when you're feeling anxious and overwhelmed about going out or reaching out to someone, what is that thought that you're thinking? Mm -hmm. Is it fear of rejection? Is mm -hmm. it, they might not want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid they won't like me. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, mm -hmm. recognize that thought, see how it makes you feel, shift that thought, mm -hmm. see how it makes you feel, okay. and keep going. And I think mm -hmm. that that's one step that most people can take, and it's been proven effective a lot. Okay. A lot of research. <laughs> Yeah, and, and um, I've been finding in um, the space, particularly with my women of color, there are a lot of um, social groups that have popped up. Mm -hmm. And I think those create really um, empowering spaces for people to start mm -hmm. to break into. I think one of the things that's unique about, I think, people of color in our communities, um, our cultures, is that community and connecting is a big part of how we kind of function and survive. Mm -hmm. And so kind of going back to those, and like you said, it could be intimidated to kind of in, enter space full, you know, fully alone. And so inviting a friend to go with you, and mm -hmm. I always encourage people is like, connect, connect with your friends. If you haven't heard them, you know, reach out. Um, and I think when people have pulled back from friends and friendships, it takes a lot of effort to kind of bring mm -hmm. them back out. And so mm -hmm. you have to be persistent with them. So don't write off your friends who might be, you know, being mm -hmm. ghosts right now. Just mm -hmm. kind of stay with it and really try to reach out and connect. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think it's, I mean, the, the, um, the, I'm learning so much right now because <laughs> I'm learning what not to do, but, um, uh, because I am that friend that's like, you know, when you talk to someone and they're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm like, knock it off. You're fine. I'm coming to get you. We're going to yeah. go do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I think sometimes it's, it's hearing people and knowing where they're at. Right. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I guess I would add is I think it's important to, um, validate someone's thoughts yes. right yes. and for, for sure. you know I'm not a you know a clinician and most mm -hmm. people aren't um, but to be able to just say I hear you I, I can feel that same mm -hmm. way at times mm -hmm. I can feel like I don't want to see anyone mm -hmm. and totally get what you're saying mm -hmm. um, so I think sometimes that's important because yes. I think it if no one ever says that and like why don't you yeah. want to go out I don't get that mm -hmm. then it in some ways makes you feel even more right. isolated right. Mm -hmm. so I think validating those those right. concerns um, and letting people know you feel heard because mm -hmm. uh, I think in our communities 
we're oftentimes silenced yes. on so many yeah. things. Mm -hmm. So having someone feel you um, mm -hmm. really is meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it, I, it makes a big difference, I think. And I think about uh, modeling, you know, I, I don't know how, you know, if you're in, in such a state of isolation, you can't see out of that, mm -hmm. but finding those peoples that, that people that model mm -hmm. um, good, um, uh, healthy interaction, mm -hmm. um, and particularly important in communities of color. Yeah. And it, you know, to your point about these people going up the ladder and losing all of that connectiveness, mm -hmm. you know, who's modeling how you are able to survive in that space, mm -hmm. but do more than survive, thrive, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, yes. I would think that that would be, you know, essentially a big part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so um, do you suggest counseling for most people if they get to that point or just trying to just work? Yeah. I think, I mean, I'm a psychologist, so I will always recommend yes, this. Right. <laughs> so what am I asking? Oh. What am I asking? Yeah. I just I'm going to say no. I mean, just briefly, but if you get to the point where yeah, it's chronic, yeah, I mean, then, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. I mean, yeah. I think um, counseling doesn't have to be something that's long term. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in that essence, too, it might be some group counseling that might be helpful mm -hmm. to kind of, again, mm -hmm. try to help model those, like as you mentioned, mm -hmm. modeling, right. you know, and practicing with Putting, people who don't. Connectedness yeah. in, pre in play yeah, mm -hmm. with exactly. how you begin mm -hmm. to address exactly. it. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's the end of our broadcast at the end, and the end of our show. And I want to thank all of our guests for joining us. And thank you for joining us. And you stay with us right now as we continue our conversation on Facebook Live and Twitter. What are some other practical ways that we can address the kind of social isolation that undermines meaningful social connection and therefore causes us to be lonely? More on that when we, go, when we come back on Facebook Live and Twitter. Thanks.